Hello, so this is a video by Phil Hernandez. He is a Christian apologist who is going to explain Wicca. I at least give it to him that he does not make up lies about witches and Satanists sacrificing human beings and drinking their blood. At least he doesn't go as far as other people who spread hateful <coughs> BS, but he still spreads some very misleading information. So let's listen in. Many, many times people, uh, Christians, well-meaning Christians who haven't done their research, assume that uh, Wiccans, witches, are Satanist, and they're really not. You know, it's an important point for us to recognize, before you refute, before you prove false a belief system, you have to understand what that belief system actually is. Why are you starting from the position of refuting it and proving it wrong? Do you not want to know what Wicca and witchcraft is? Why not focus on the similarity of these beliefs? Maybe approach it from the position of an outsider? Don't you want to understand what they actually believe? Why don't you have a Wiccan come in and explain it? They could have a Q&A session. Hmm, mic problems, huh? Should I, ra should I raise it up, or...? It's okay. We'll wait. So he killed three people, gravely injured another, and, um... He is talking about a murder-suicide that happened on a military base in 1990. I found this article on the Los Angeles Times from January 20th of 1990. Shyam David Drizpal, a 23-year-old petty officer assigned to the weapons system of the Trident Submarine Michigan, allegedly shot two crewmates and two civilians before committing suicide on Tuesday. We really don't have any idea about the motive, Navy spokesman Lieutenant Commander Keith Afterburn said. We're looking at everything in this investigation. He said a team of 35 to 40 Navy investigators, including forensic specialists from San Diego and San Francisco, was working on the case. Afterburn said that none of the three sailors from the Michigan had any disciplinary record. Autopsy results were pending, so it was not yet known whether drugs were a factor. However, Navy authorities acknowledged that they confiscated an unregistered pistol from Drizpal, but unaware of the murder on the base, let him go just hours after his crewmates were killed. Drizbal then went into nearby Bremerton, where he killed a pawn shop clerk and seriously wounded her brother in obtaining another gun, Bremerton Police Chief Dilbert McNeil said. We figure after having done his deed in Bancor, remorse set in and he believes there's only one thing to do, kill himself. And he had to get another weapon, McNeil said. Drizbal's body was found Wednesday in a motel room about 100 miles away in Hazel Dell, Washington. A car belonging to Drizbal's roommate, Dave David Allen Parker, 21, was outside and a gun taken from the pawn shop was in the room, McNeil said. From the Seattle Times, during their lengthy investigation, naval detectives learned from Drizpal's peers that he abused alcohol and claimed to have been trained in assassination and martial arts by his grandfather. He also claimed he was given permission to carry a concealed weapon on base because his family had been threatened. It is against base policy to carry concealed weapons and Drizpal did not have permission. And through the course of the investigation, he, he killed himself in Vancouver, Washington, in a hotel. He ate half a, half a bag of Doritos and half a diet soda. I still, um, I'm still puzzled why he would go with diet <coughs> soda at that point. And then he, and then he shot himself. Well, I'm, I'm like, if you're going to shoot yourself, I mean, why watch the calories? I constantly fail to understand the Christian worldview of sin and immorality. If this man committed murder, why do you not hate the sin and not the sinner? He most likely came to the decision to commit suicide after realizing he was going to be spending the rest of his life in jail. I really don't see the humor in this. But whatever the case, uh, um, you know, a very unfortunate event, but I remember uh, 
Lieutenant Spencer, who later became the, the chief, he was from Long Island, transplant from Long Island. We're still friends and we stay in touch and all. And um, There was no mention of a Lieutenant Spencer in any of the articles I read. I don't necessarily believe this is a fabrication on Phil's part. Can I call you, Phil? Okay. But this person was not interviewed for either the Los Angeles Times or the Seattle Times articles. But I remember Lieutenant Spencer was telling us they couldn't figure out he, he excelled as a sailor until he got hooked on the, the, the role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons and then he started calling himself an assassin which was his board game name but he would call himself the assassin even when he wasn't playing. It was, it was almost like he would play these fantasy role-playing games and he could never get out of that fantasy. That fantasy became his real world and so guys made fun of him for being weird for doing that and then he eventually assassinated two of them, and the rest is history. Well, when he said that, two fellow police officers in a small department of only about 100 police officers were offended and started freaking out and this and that, and everybody's wondering, why are these two guys so upset about this? And so as time went on, we started finding out um, that these two guys in, a, in our police department were practicing Wiccans. They were practicing witches. So what? Wiccans fill all manner of roles in our society, law enforcement being one of them. Also, I highly doubt they were offended. If anything, they probably raised a concern as it was not relevant to the investigation. Oh, and by the way, my nerd audience would never forgive me for letting this one slide by, but Dungeons and Dragons is not a board game. And so all of a sudden it made sense for why the guy was wearing a skull ring and, and things of that sort. And they were just, but, but basically, this, this is back in probably, I don't know, 1990. Um, and you could have two police officers in a department. And by the way, they weren't fired for being witches. So, I mean, this is becoming part of mainstream American culture. If police officers are wearing personal jewelry while on duty, I am sure that it is addressed in their dress policy. Dungeons and Dragons has nothing to do with modern witchcraft. As for Dungeons and Dragons or any role-playing game, for that matter, having an influence on a person's mental state from a Psychology Today article written on Dungeons and Dragons and the 90s Satanic Panic written by a David J. Lay, PhD clinical psychologist. In the early 1990s, the concern over D&D melded with the social fright over satanic ritual abuse. Eight percent of the American population was alleged to be secret Satanists and countless crimes, murders, and suicides were blamed on the insidious influence of secret Satan worshiping. Wild claims proliferated that some games contained secret instructions on hacking, which actually led to the U.S. Secret Service conducting a raid on one game manufacturer, and that D&D books were printed using ink containing secret Soviet mind control chemicals, undoubtedly MK Ultra chemicals. Around the United States, the recovered memory movement boomed and charges of child abuse and secret satanic rituals were believed to occur in every neighborhood and city. Research showed that rates of suicide in registered players of role-playing games was actually lower than the general population. Empirical research demonstrated that role-playing games had no measurable negative impact on psychological functioning, emotional measures, or reality testing. This was pretty well debunked in the 1990s, so your supposed Wiccan police officers were most likely more knowledgeable on this topic than you or your Lieutenant Spencer. So much truth to you that you could never find through the five senses, but be content with that. Because the secret things belong to me. And what the witches are saying is, no, we're not content with God's word. In fact, we don't even like God's word unless we can twist it totally out of context to make it support our pagan views. Pagans are not content with God's word unless they can twist it to support their views? What the hell does that mean? The common 66 books that make up the King James Version of the Bible outright condemns sorcery, witchcraft, magic, divination, astrology, etc. It is a viewpoint that is literally antithetical to most 
pagan viewpoints. I certainly have no desire to bend the Bible to fit my worldview, and I highly doubt any adherent or reconstructionist of any pre-Christian belief does either. Wiccans already have worldviews shaped by the tradition and culture they follow. But we're not content with the Word of God. We want the secret things. We want to tap into secret formulas and secret traditions to try to access power and gain power over nature. Um, and, and that's what we're here for. We're not here to worship the God of the Bible. We can study the occult because there is a lot of wisdom and knowledge there. Sure, some of it is medieval Christian superstition, but the hidden sciences is what gave us chemistry, mathematics, pharmacology, astrophysics, the heliocentric model of the universe, anatomy, even the scientific method stemmed from this occult knowledge that was deemed heretical by the church. Witches do not want to control and have power over nature, but rather observe it and learn from it. By observing and learning from nature, we can then mimic it often with very interesting results. If we would have never explored this heretical or hidden knowledge, we would not have the modern society we have today. Okay, and no, no slam on Josh McDowell. He's a great scholar, but whatever the case, when it came to witchcraft, he went pretty much by what was the traditional medieval witchcraft. So there's black magic and white magic, and there's witches and warlocks and stuff like that. The modern witchcraft movement looks nothing like medieval witchcraft. Yes, I would have to agree with you here. Medieval witchcraft was shaped by Christian superstition. Scholars today have to weed through the history of the witchcraft trials and determine what was possibly based on a folk tradition, the leftover of pre-Christian practices, or what the church inquisitors threw in to suit them. Modern witchcraft practices today are focused around folk traditions and pre-Christian practices using evidence we have to today. Our oldest and most continuous magical traditions stem from the Western occult tradition, of which Wicca is very similar. Either it was influenced by occult knowledge, or it evolved along with it. Uh, they also claim that there are, they, they refuse to acknowledge, and I think that there's probably self-styled Wiccans that probably do use occultic powers for the bad of mankind that would be black magic but they claim anybody who's into black magic is closer to satanist they're only into white magic okay this whole black and white magic thing is getting really outdated and useless it is based off the christian belief of the christ and the antichrist this archaic concept stems from zoroastrian belief it is childishly simplistic magic is magic like electricity it is a force that can be used for those who wield it personal responsibility is taken by those who use it if one uses magic for whatever purpose then they deal with the consequences of their actions. And I am not going to get into karma or the law of three or the law of return here. I will leave this for each person to discover for themselves. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, witches are, they make up small covens. There's no hierarchy. There's no like one head witch of all the witches. Or at least not since Alexander's died because he was labeled as King of the Witches. Or one head committee that says, hey, you gotta believe this and you gotta believe that. So, um, so it's very decentralized, small covens, small groups that gather, no hierarchy, it's decentralized. Um, they often claim to be a continuation of an abiding but hidden form of ancient witchcraft. This is very unlikely. Okay, this is like some idea that that today's witches have been in hiding for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, and that they've had this long line of witches. It's very unlikely. There's a reason why they're called uh, neo-pagans, because now they're a new group of pagans arriving on the scene, although they want to trace their roots. The term neo-pagan grew out from the pagan movement of the 1960s. Although I'm not certain he coined it, but the pagan scholar Isaac Bonewitz was fond of this term and helped popularize it. There are a few people who claim a hereditary lineage going back to medieval times, but this is very rare. 
Those who make such a claim have very little to no evidence to support such a claim going back further than a generation or two. The one tradition we do have that goes back in recorded history and literature is the Western occult tradition, of which a few modern witchcraft practices bear similarity to. We also have superstitions, folk medicine, folklore, folk traditions, etc. that go back in history. Yeah, the roots of their ideas go back to ancient times, but not really the roots of their movement. So there hasn't been like successive generations of um of Wiccans. It is really hard to take a snapshot of such an evolving practice. Modern day witches live in the modern world. We are not LARPing in the medieval past. We are living in the here and now. Many witches adapt their practice to fall in tune with the times and the world around them. Uh, they're opposed to traditional religions, especially Christianity. I am most certainly not opposed to Christianity. I believe it has a lot of wisdom, and I have met many decent people who are Christian, as well as many other denominations. However, it is not for me. I will get judgmental and make fun of Christians like yourself who try to attack, libel, and demonize my beliefs. So, I guess you could call it an aggressively defensive position. It is still a defensive position, and maybe one day I'll run out of videos to make responses to. Who am I kidding? I'm stuck here like Dante's Inferno. I'm living in my own personal hell. Uh, very experience-based. They de-emphasize reason. So if you just, if you have an experience and you just feel real good about that experience, you don't test the spirits with reason or with the Word of God, okay? You just experience for the sake of experience. Uh, they believe that all life is sacred, that there's a life force in nature, and that the distinction between matter and the spirit is not real. It would be very difficult to generalize an individual beliefs of various witches and pagans, but I think for the most part, most do feel that life is sacred. I would say that most occultists, witches, pagans, and druids that I have met value reason over experience. Reason and experience often work in conjunction with each other. However, for myself, reason does tend to take precedent over experience. Why would I test my experience through the Word of God when that is not my belief system? Personally, I do not believe in a deity or deities, and I am an atheist, although most pagans are theists. The source of experience is very important in magic. Often our greatest gifts of imagination can trick us. We can trick ourselves by perceiving things that are not real, and we can attribute something to magic that was actually a coincidence. We can force associations where there are none. I would also agree that many pagans do see a life force in nature. This most likely stems from our ability to project human characteristics on inanimate objects. We see the natural world around us as part of us. We see the interconnectivity of life. Persona Identifying nature is an understandable conclusion. I would say some pagans see matter as holding spirit. We can see something alive made of matter and spirit. When it ceases to exist, the matter is still there, but it is definitely missing consciousness, that thing we identify as spirit. This is really dependent on each individual and their particular beliefs. With them, they deny absolute truth. Most, most witches say, what's true for me is true for me doesn't have to be true for you and vice versa. So they deny absolute truth. So they might say to you, well, Jesus might be God for you, but he's not God for me. He might be savior for you, but he's not savior for me. So they deny absolute truth. And then they also deny absolute morality. They deny absolute truth. What? I'll set aside the whole philosophical debate of what is truth. If you are stating that you, as a Christian apologist, deals only in absolutes, then you are in the deepest denial of intellectual dishonesty I have ever had the misfortune of encountering. And I might say to you that, well, Kerninos might be God for you, but he's not God for me. So if you are saying that God exists and this is an absolute truth, then I could claim Kerninos exists and this is an absolute truth. However, the fact that you and I have two different answers for the same conceptual idea proves that both are subjective. Objective truth is that a circle cannot be a square and a square cannot be a circle. This is an absolute truth. However, we can imagine a flying spaghetti monster, and to us it is real, but it is not an absolute truth. It is a subjective truth. We deny absolute morality. 
I made this video way too long already, and I don't think this would be a quick answer, so let's save it for next week. Thank you all for watching, and blessed be.